Welcome to the MD Edge Daily News for Tuesday, August 28th. I'm your host, Nick Andrews. And I'm Mary Ellen Schneider. Today, rivaroxaban is no help for heart failure outcomes. Also today, risk for VTE is unchanged by rivaroxaban following discharge. And later, the American Academy of Pediatrics cautions against marijuana use during pregnancy. But we begin with continued coverage of the 2018 Annual Congress of the European Society of Cardiology from Munich. New results from the ASCEND trial show that neither aspirin nor fish oil provided any net clinical benefit for primary cardiovascular prevention in patients with diabetes. These data are a double blow to the current widespread routine use of low-dose aspirin and fish oil for these patients. ASCEND is a randomized, blinded trial that included more than 15,000 patients with diabetes in the United Kingdom who had no known cardiovascular disease. Patients were placed on 100 milligrams per day of enteric-coated aspirin or placebo and 1 gram per day of omega-3 fatty acids or placebo. The primary endpoint was occurrence of a first serious vascular event. Speaking at ESC 2018, Dr. Jane Armitage reported that aspirin reduced the absolute risk of a serious vascular event by 1.1% compared with placebo while boosting the risk of major bleeding by 0.9%. Dr. Armitage is a professor of clinical trials and epidemiology at the University of Oxford in England. She spoke with our Bruce Jansen at ESC 2018 on why the data may have turned out this way. The data on which uh, diabetes was considered a cardiovascular equivalent is old now. I mean, it, it's de- some decades old. And if we look at contemporary data among well-treated people with diabetes, people who are on statins, people who are on blood pressure lowering, people whose glucose is well controlled and they're not smoking, it's not clear that they do have anywhere near the risk of secondary di- disease, uh, secondary prevention patients. So I think we need to begin to change our paradigm. Um, And one of the other interesting uh, sort of findings from the study is only 28% of the deaths were due to cardiovascular and vascular causes. Now, the mantra for many years has been people with diabetes die from vascular disease, but actually more people died from cancer in our study. So about 40% of the deaths were from cancer, whereas less than 30% were actually due to vascular causes. And I think that that's a reflection of much better management of the diabetes um, and the risk factors that we know are um, important in terms of risk um, and we know that those treatments statins blood pressure lowering glucose lowering are generally pretty safe treatments unlike aspirin which has this uh, obvious side effect of increasing the bleeding at the same time as reducing the risk. Also from ESC 2018, patients with heart disease, coronary artery disease, and normal sinus rhythm did not experience a significantly reduced risk of death, myocardial infarction, or stroke with rivaroxaban. This is according to data presented at the meeting by Dr. Fayez Zanad of France. The COMMANDER trial included data from more than 5,000 patients with coronary artery disease or reduced left ventricular ejection fraction, as well as a number of other factors. The researchers randomly assigned patients to receive either 2.5 milligrams of rivaroxaban twice daily or placebo. Patients were assessed at weeks 4 and 12 and then every 12 weeks. Death, MI, or stroke occurred in 25% of patients who received rivaroxaban, compared with just over 26% of patients in the placebo group. Secondary efficacy outcomes were also similar. Dr. Zanad says that these results suggest that while low-dose rivaroxaban is safe, it also offers no treatment benefit. So what's behind the failure of the drug? He says it's likely that thrombin-mediated events are not the major driver of heart failure-related events in patients with a recent hospitalization for heart failure. You can read more about the COMMANDER trial by clicking the link in the description. And now, more rivaroxaban news from ESC 2018. 
Results from the Mariner trial show that receiving rivaroxaban after being hospitalized for medical illness did not significantly reduce the risk of venous thromboembolism. These results were also published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Dr. Alex Baropoulos is a researcher at Hofstra University in New York. He says that studies of extended thromboprophylaxis have shown either excess major bleeding or a benefit that is based mainly on reducing the risk of asymptomatic DVT. In this study, he and his colleagues sought to clarify the benefits of rivaroxaban after hospitalization while also modifying previous study regimens to limit major bleeding risk. Mariner is a double-blind study that includes data from more than 12,000 patients who were hospitalized for medical illness and also had an increased risk for VTE. Researchers randomly assigned patients to receive either 10 mg per day of rivaroxaban or placebo for 45 days after discharge. The researchers report that efficacy was similar in both groups. They also report that major bleeding was slightly more common in patients who received rivaroxaban. That being said, Dr. Spiropoulos says that in large populations, the marginal benefit of rivaroxaban might outweigh the increased bleeding risk. He does note, however, that the usefulness of extended thromboprophylaxis remains uncertain. And finally today, from Family Practice News... The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that women avoid marijuana while pregnant and breastfeeding, as the long-term effects of prenatal and childhood exposure to marijuana are not known, but are potentially harmful to mother and child. This is according to a recent clinical report published in the Journal of Pediatrics. Dr. Cheryl Ryan is the chair of the AAP Committee on Substance Use and Prevention, She says that the fact that marijuana is legal in many states may give the impression that the drug is harmless during pregnancy, especially with stories swirling on social media about using it for nausea with morning sickness. However, she notes that this is still a big question. Indeed, she says that based on the limited evidence available, there is cause for concern about how the drug will impact the long-term development of children. Studies have reported any level of marijuana use among pregnant women put the mothers at risk of anemia, while their newborns had an increased risk of low birth weight and NICU use. Further research has shown impaired mental development, executive function deficits, and behavioral problems among children exposed to marijuana. The rate of marijuana use among women ages 18 to 44 has increased in the past 15 years or so. As of 2014, more than 7% of women between 18 and 25 years of age report having used marijuana in the past month. And that concludes this edition of the MD Edge Daily News. MD Edge is covering the ESC 2018 all week. Be sure to subscribe to the Daily News for all the latest in cardiology news and much more. For MD Edge, I'm Mary Ellen Schneider. And I'm Nick Andrews, coming up tomorrow on the MD Edge Sitecast. In this podcast, I will be talking about the role of cognitive behavioral therapy in treating major depressive disorder. You can subscribe to the Sitecast, the daily news, and all of our podcasts on Amazon Alexa, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts.